Good evening, and welcome to Middle Earth Storytime. And I have got all the wrong things open. Let me fix this. So we don't need that. We don't need that. We don't need that. <laughs> Completely set up for the wrong program. And now we're good. So let's back up and try that one more time. Good evening and welcome to Middle Earth Storytime. My name is Edwin. And I'll be your storyteller this evening. We'll be reading Chapter 8 of The Hatchet by Gary Paulson. Maybe even Chapter 9. We'll see. Take a moment and say hello to everyone. I see Lady Celtic Moon. She says, howdy. Salutations. In West Texas. I see Devaney Wilson says, swinging by again, even though I can't make it. Hatchet was one of the first books I remember reading and actually enjoying in school. She reread it a few months ago. So glad you're, you're reading it. Well, you're welcome. And thank you for stopping in and saying hello. <laughs> Took a trip up to Washington, D.C. earlier this week. Just, uh, just spent one day in Washington itself. I think one day was enough. Maybe an extra day would have been good. We, we went and saw, what do we see? The botanical gardens. We walked around the, a lot of the exterior of the buildings and then spent a good amount of time in the Natural History Museum and the National Art Gallery. I think if I go up there again, I would almost almost like to budget a whole day, a whole day just for the National Art Gallery. I only probably some about a quarter of what I wanted to see. But that's probably one of the more pleasant places there because it's not too crowded. It's it's quiet and it's uh, yeah, it's absolutely beautiful artwork in there. So I had a great time there. Hey, there is Janet Forrester, my favorite aunt. She says, hello, and so ready to relax for a reading. And Janet, I took a, a, don't let Bernie boy, don't let Bernie the dog tell you any tales. I took him for a short walk this morning. So I'm, I'm, I'm not in Hawaii anymore. I am in rural North Carolina, and I went to a gun show for the first time in years, and that was... That was a lot of fun going around and looking at various firearms and all kind of all kind of nonsense they had. If you wanted to become a soldier of fiction, they have all kinds of tactical tactical gear. I should probably write that out in the in the chat. Tacti. There we go. Why is my my keyboard's acting funny? Huh. It's acting very slow. Let me know if there's any problems. Let me know if there's any problems with the audio or the video. I just noticed my computer was acting a little funny. So let me know if we get any delays. But we're reading a story called The Hatchet by Gary Paulson. So let's dive into that. Let's dive into that. When we left off, when we left off, our protagonist, our protagonist is doing the very best he can after crashing an airplane into the Canadian wilderness and having a bad experience with, he calls them gut cherries. The, the fruit he was eating is called a chokeberry. So this is chapter eight. At first he thought it was a growl in the steel darkness of the shelter in the middle of the night. His eyes came open, and he was awake and thought there was a growl. But it was the wind. Medium wind in the pines had made some sound that brought him up, brought him awake. He sat up and was hit with the smell. It terrified him. The smell was one of rot, some musty rot that made him think only of graves with cobwebs and dust and old death. His nostrils widened, and he opened his eyes wider, but he could see nothing. It was too dark, too hard dark with clouds covering even the small light from the stars, and he could not see. But the smell was alive, 
alive and full in the shelter. He thought of the bear, thought of Bigfoot and every monster he had ever seen in every fright movie he had ever watched, and his heart hammered in his throat. Then he heard the slithering, a brushing sound, a slithering brushing sound near his feet, and he kicked out as hard as he could, kicked out and threw the hatchet at the sound, a noise coming from his throat. But the hatchet missed and sailed into the wall where it hit the rocks with a shower of sparks, and his leg was instantly torn with pain as if a hundred needles had been driven into it. Ah! Now he screamed with the pain and fear and skittered on his backside up into the corner of the shelter, breathing through his mouth, straining to see, to hear. The slithering moved again. He thought toward him at first, and terror took him, stopping his breath. He felt he could see a low, dark form, a bulk in the darkness, a shadow that lived. But now it moved away, slithering and scraping, it moved away, and he thought he saw, saw it go out of the door opening. He lay on his side for a moment, then pulled a rasping breath in and held it, listening for the attacker to return. When it was apparent that the shadow wasn't coming back, he felt the calf of his leg where the pain was centered and spreading to feel the whole leg. His fingers gingerly touched a group of needles that had been driven through his pants and into the fleshy part of the calf. They were stiff and very sharp on the ends that stuck out, and he knew then what the attacker had been. A porcupine had stumbled into his shelter, and when he had kicked it, the thing had slapped him with its tail of quills. He touched each quill carefully. The pain made it seem as if dozens of them had been slammed into his leg, but there were only eight, pinning the cloth against his skin. He leaned back against the wall for a minute. He couldn't leave them in. They had to come out but just touching them made the pain more intense. So fast, he thought, so fast things change. When he'd gone to sleep, he had satisfaction, and in just a moment it was all different. He grasped one of the quills, held his breath, and jerked. It sent pain signals to his brain in tight waves, but he grabbed another, pulled it, then another quill, when he had pulled four of them, he stopped for a moment. The pain had gone from being a pointed injury pain to spreading in a hot smear up his leg, and it made him catch his breath. Some of the quills were driven in deeper than others, and they tore when they came out. He breathed deeply twice, let half the breath out, and then went back to work. Jerk, pause, jerk. And three more times he lay back in the darkness, done. The pain filled his leg now, and with it came new, for new waves of self-pity. Sitting alone in the dark, his legs aching, some mosquitoes finding him again. He started crying. It was all too much, just too much, and he couldn't take it not the way it was. I can't take it this way, alone with no fire in the dark, and the next time it might be something worse, maybe a bear. It wouldn't be just quills in the leg. It would be worse. I can't do this, he thought, again and again. I can't. Brian pulled himself up until he was sitting upright back in the corner of the cave. He put his head back down on his arms across his knees, with stiffness taking his left leg, and cried until he was cried out. He did not know how long it took, but later on he looked back at the time of crying in the corner of the dark cave, and thought of it as when he learned the most important rule of survival which was that feeling sorry for yourself 
didn't work. It wasn't just that it was wrong to do, or that it was considered incorrect. It was more than that. It didn't work. When he sat alone in the darkness and cried and was done, all done with it, nothing had changed. His legs still hurt. It was still dark. He was still alone. And the self-pity had accomplished nothing. At last he slept again, but already his patterns were changing and the sleep was light. A resting doze more than a deep sleep, with small sounds awakening twice in the rest of the night. In the last doze period before daylight, before he awakened finally, with the morning light and the clouds of new mosquitoes, he dreamed. This time it was not of his mother, not of the secret, but of his father at first, and his friend, Terry. In the initial segment of the dream, his father was standing at the side of a living room, looking at him, and it was clear from his expression that he was trying to tell Brian something. His lip moved, but there was no sound, not a whisper. He waved his hands at Brian, made gestures in front of his face as if he were scratching something, and he worked to make a word with his mouth, but at first Brian could not see. Then the lips made a mmm shape, but no sound came. Mmm, ma. Brian could not hear it, could not understand, and he wanted to so badly. It was so important to understand his father, to know what he was saying. He was trying to help, trying so hard. And when Brian couldn't understand, he looked cross. The way he did when Brian asked questions more than once, and he faded. Brian's father faded into a fog place Brian could not see. And the dream was almost over, or seemed to be, when Terry came. He was not gesturing to Brian, but he was sitting in the park at a bench looking at a barbecue pit. And for a time, nothing happened. Then he got up and poured some charcoal from a bag into the cooker, and then some starter fluid, and he took a flick type of lighter and lent the fluid. When it was burning and the charcoal was at last getting hot, he turned, noticing Brian for the first time in the dream. He turned and smiled and pointed to the fire as if to say, See? A fire. But it meant nothing to Brian, except that he wished he had a fire. He saw a grocery sack on the table next to Terry. Brian thought it must contain hot dogs and chips and mustard, and he could think only of the food. But Terry shook his head and pointed again to the fire. Twice more he pointed to the fire, made Brian see the flames, and Brian felt his frustration and anger rise, and he thought, All right, all right, I see the fire, but so what? I don't have a fire. I know about fire. I know I need a fire. I know that. His eyes opened wide, and there was a light in the cave. A gray, dim light. A warning. He wiped his mouth and tried to move his leg, which had stiffened like wood. There was thirst and hunger, and he ate some raspberries from the jacket. They had spoiled a bit, seemed softer and mushier but still had a rich sweetness. He crushed the berries against the roof of his mouth with his tongue and drank the sweet juice as it ran down his throat. A flash of metal caught his eyes, and he saw the hatchet in the sand where he had thrown it at the porcupine in the dark. He scooched up, wincing a bit when he bent his stiff leg and crawled to where the hatchet lay. He picked it up and examined it and saw a chip in the top of the head. The nick wasn't too large, but the hatchet was important to him. It was his only tool, and he should not have thrown it. He should have kept it in his hand and made a tool of some kind to help push an animal away. Make a staff, he thought, or a lance, and save the hatchet. Something came then, a thought as he held the hatchet. Something about the dream and his father and Terry, but he couldn't pin it down. Ah, he scrambled out and stood in the morning sun and stretched his back muscles and his sore leg. The hatchet was still in his hand, and as he stretched and raised it over its head, 
It caught the first rays of the morning sun. The first faint light hit the silver of the hatchet and flashed a brilliant gold in the light. Like fire. That's it, he thought. That's what they were trying to tell me. Fire. The hatchet was the key to it all. When he threw the hatchet at the porcupine in this cave and missed and hit the stone wall, it had showered sparks. A golden shower of sparks in the dark, as golden with fire as the sun was now. The hatchet was the answer. That's what his father and Terry had been trying to tell him. Somehow he could get fire from the hatchet. The sparks would make fire. Brian went back into the shelter and studied the wall. It was some form of chunky granite or some sandstone, but embedded in it were larger pieces of a darker stone, a harder and a darker stone. It only took him a moment to find where the hatchet had struck. The steel had nicked into the edge of one of the darker stone pieces. Brian turned his head backward so he would strike with the flat rear of the hatchet, and hit the black lot gently. Too gently and nothing happened. He struck harder a glancing blow, and two or three weak sparks skipped off the rock and died immediately. He swung harder, held the hatchet so it would heal a longer sliding blow, and the black rock exploded in fire. Sparks flew so heavily that several of them skittered and jumped on the sand beneath the rock and he smiled and struck again and again. There could be fire here, he thought. I will have a fire here, he thought, and struck again. I will have fire from the hatchet. Chapter 9 oh, Starting to drink my, my wife's coffee. <laughs> Chapter 9 Brian found it was a long way from sparks to fire. Clearly there had to be something for the sparks to ignite, some kind of tinder or kindling. But what? He brought some dried grass in, tapped sparks into it, and watched them die. He tried small twigs, breaking them into little pieces, but that was worse than grass. Then he tried a combination of the two, grass and twigs. Nothing. He had no trouble getting sparks, but the tiny bits of hot stone or metal, he couldn't tell what they were, just sputtered and died. He needed something finer, something soft, fine, and fluffy to catch the bits of fire. Shredded paper would be nice, but he had no paper. So close, he said aloud. So close. He put the hatchet back in his belt and went out of the shelter, limping on his sore leg. There had to be something. Had to be. Man had made fire. There had been fire for thousands, millions of years. He dug into his pockets and found the twenty-dollar bill in his wallet. Paper. Worthless paper out here. But if he could get a fire going... He ripped the twenty into tiny pieces, made a pile of pieces and hit sparks into them. Nothing happened. They just wouldn't take with the sparks. But there had to be a way, some way to do it. Not twenty feet to his right, leaning out over the water, were birches, and he stood looking at them for a full half minute before they registered in his mind. They were beautiful white birch with bark like clean, slightly speckled paper. Paper. He moved to the trees. Where the bark was peeling from the trunks, it lifted in tiny tendrils, almost fluffs. Brian plucked some of them loose and rolled them in his fingers. They seemed flammable, dry, and nearly powdery. He pulled and twisted bits off the trees, packing them in one hand. And while he picked them with the other, picking and gathering, until he had a wad close to the size of a baseball. Then he went back into the shelter and arranged the bow of birch bark peelings at the base of the black rock. As an afterthought, he threw in the remains of the twenty-dollar bill. 
He struck and a stream of sparks fell into the bark and quickly died. But this time, one spark fell on one small hair of dry bark, almost a thread of bark, and seemed to glow a bit finer, brighter before it died. The material had to be finer. There had to be a soft and incredibly fine nest for the sparks. I must make a home for the sparks, he thought. A perfect home where they won't stay. They won't make fire. He started ripping the bark using his fingernails at first. And when they didn't work, but he used the sharp edge of the hatchet, cutting the bark in thin slivers, hair so fine they're almost not there. It was painstaking work, slow work, and he stayed with it for over two hours. Twice he stopped for a handful of berries and once to go to the lake for a drink, then back to work, the sun on his back, until at last he had a ball of fluff as big as a grapefruit, dry birch bark fluff. He positioned his sparks, nest, as he thought of it, at the base of the rock, and used his thumb to make a small depression in the middle. He slammed the back of the hatchet down across the black rock. A cloud of sparks rained down, most of them missing the nest, but some, perhaps thirty or two, hit in the depression, and of those six or seven found fuel and grew and smoldered and caused the bark to take on a red glow. Then they went out. Close. He was close. He positioned the nest, made a new and smaller dent with his thumb, and struck again. More sparks. A slight glow, then nothing. It's me, he thought. I'm doing something wrong now. I don't know how to do this. A cave dweller would have had fire by now. A crow magnum man would have had fire by now. But I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to make a fire. Maybe not making enough sparks. He settled the nest in place once more and hit the rock with a series of blows as fast as he could. The sparks flowed like a golden waterfall. At first they seemed to take, there were several, many sparks that found like. It took briefly, but they all died. Starved. He leaned back. They're like me. They're starving. It wasn't quantity. There were plenty of sparks, but they needed more. I would kill, he thought suddenly, for a book of matches. Just one book. Just one match. I would kill. What makes fire? He thought back to school, to all those science classes. Had he ever learned what made a fire? Did the teacher ever stand up and say, this is what makes a fire. He shook his head, tried to focus his thoughts. What did it take? You have to have fuel, he thought, and he had that. The bark was fuel. Oxygen. There had to be air. He needed to add air. He had to fan on it, blow on it. He made the nest again and held the hatchet backward, tensed and struck four quick blows. Sparks came down, and he leaned forward as fast as he could and blow. Too hard. There was a bright, almost intense glow. Then it was gone. He had blown it out. Another set of strikes. More sparks. He leaned and blew, but gently this time, holding back and aiming the stream of air from his mouth to hit the brightest spot. Five or six sparks had fallen in a tight mass of bark hair, and Brian centered his efforts there. The sparks grew with his gentle breath. The red glow moved from the sparks themselves into the bark, moved and grew and became worms. Glowing red worms that crawled up the bark hairs and caught other threads of bark and grew into there was a pocket of red as big as a quarter, a glowing red hole of heat. And when he read out of birth, breath and paused to inhale, the red ball suddenly burst into flame. Fire, he yelled. I've got it. I've got fire. I've got it. 
but the flames were thick and oily and burning fast, consuming the bowl of bark as fast as if it were gasoline. He had to keep the flames, keep them going. Working as fast as he could, he carefully placed the dried grass and wood pieces he had tried at first on top of the bark and was gratified to see them take. But they would go fast. He needed more and more. He could not let the flames go out. He ran from the shelters of the pines and started breaking off the low, dead small limbs. These he threw in the shelter and went back for more, threw those in and squatted to break and feed the hungry flames. When the small wood was going well, he went out and found larger wood and did not relax until that was going. Then he leaned back against the wood brace of his door opening and smiled. I have a friend, he thought. I have a friend now, a hungry friend, but a good one. I have a friend named Fire. Hello, Fire. The curve of the rock made an almost perfect drawing flue that carried the smoke up through the cracks of the roof, but held the heat. If he kept the fire small, it would be perfect, and would keep anything like the porcupine from coming through the door again. A friend and a guard, he thought. So much from a little spark. A friend and a guard from a tiny spark. He looked around and wished he had someone to tell this thing, to show this thing he had done. But there was nobody. Nothing but the trees and the sun and the breeze and the lake. Nobody. And he thought rolling thoughts, with the smoke curling up over his head and the smile still half on his face. He thought, I wonder what they're doing now. I wonder what my father is doing now. I wonder what my mother is doing now. I wonder if she's with him. It brings us to chapter 10. Let me see how many pages are in chapter 10. Yeah, we can get in chapter 10 too. Let's see. Hey, there's Hi Man. I'm Bob. Hey, there's Mara. Hey, Grantish Crosby. Good to see you. Janet Forrester says, Yay, fire. Fire is something we take for granted, yeah? Most of us can kind of heat or cool ourselves as we want, and if you need to cook something, well, you may not even use fire. You may just head for the microwave <laughs> chapter 10 he could not at first leave the fire it was so precious to him so close and sweet a thing the yellow and red flames brightening the dark interior of the shelter the happy crackle of the dry wood as it burned that he could not leave it he went to the trees and brought in as many dead limbs as he could chop off and carry. And when he had a large pile of them, he sat near the fire. Thano was getting into the warm middle part of the day, and he was hot, and broke them into small pieces and fed the fire. I will not let you out, he thought, he said to himself, to the flames. Not ever. And so he sat through a long part of the day, keeping the flames even, eating from his stock of raspberry, leaving to drink from the lake when he was thirsty. In the afternoon toward the evening, with his face smoke-smeared and his skin red from the heat, he finally began to think of head of what he needed to do. He would need a large wood pile to get through the night. It would be almost impossible to find wood in the dark, so he had to have it all cut and stacked before the sun went down. Brian made certain the fire was banked with new wood, then went out of the shelter and searched for a good wood supply. Up the hill from the campsite, the same windstorm that had left him a place to land the plane, and that only been three or four days ago, had dropped three large white pines across each other. They were dead now, dry and filled with weathered dry 
dry, dead limbs, enough for many days. He chopped and broke and carried wood back to the camp, stacking the pieces under the overhang until he had what he thought to be an enormous pile, as high as his head and six feet across at the base. Between trips, he added small pieces to the fire to keep it going, and on one of the trips to get wood, he noticed an added advantage of the fire. When he was in the shade of the trees, breaking limbs, the mosquitoes swarmed on him as usual. But when he came to the fire, or just near the shelter where the smoke eddied and swirled, the insects were gone. It was a wonderful discovery. The mosquitoes had nearly driven him mad, and the thought of being rid of them lifted his spirits. On another trip, he looked back and saw the smoke curling up to the trees, and realized for the first time that he now had the means to make a sim signal. He could carry a burning stick and build a signal and perhaps attract attention, which meant more wood and still more wood. There did not seem to be an end to the wood he would need, and he spent all the rest of the afternoon into dusk making wood trips. At dark he settled into the night, next to the fire with the stack of short pieces ready to put on, and he ate the rest of the raspberries. During all the work of the day his leg had loosened, but it still ached a bit, and he rubbed it and watched the fire and thought for the first time since the crash that he might be getting a handle on things, might be starting to do something other than just sit. He was out of food, but he could look tomorrow, and he could build a signal fire tomorrow, and get more wood tomorrow. The fire cut the night coolness, and settled him back into sleep, thinking of tomorrow. He slept hard and wasn't sure what awakened him, but his eyes came open and he stared into the darkness. The fire had burned down. He looked out, but he stirred it with a piece of wood and found a bed of coals still glowing hot and red. With small pieces of wood and careful blowing, he soon had a blaze going again. It had been close. He had to be sure to try and sleep in short intervals, so he could keep the fire going. And he tried to think of a way to regulate his sleep, but it made him sleepy to think about it, and he was just going under again when he heard the sound outside. It was not unlike the sound of the porcupine, something slithering and being dragged across the sand. But when he looked out the door opening, it was too dark to see anything. Whatever it was stopped making that sound a few moments, and he thought he heard something sloshing into the water at the shoreline. But he had the fire now, and plenty of wood, so he wasn't as worried as he had been the night before. He dozed and slept for a time, awakened again just at dawn gray light, and added wood to the steel foot smoking fire before standing outside and stretching. Standing with his arms stretched over his head and the tight knot of hunger in his stomach, he looked toward the lake and saw the tracks. They were strange. A main center line up from the lake in the sand with claw marks to the side leading to a small pile of sand, then going back down to the water. He walked over and squatted near them, studied them, and tried to make sense of them. Whatever had made the tracks had some kind of flat dragging bottom in the middle and was apparently pushed along by the legs that stuck out to the side. Up from the water to a small pile of sand, then back down into the water. Some animal, some kind of water animal that came to the sand. To do what? Do something with the sand? To play and make a pile in the sand? He smiled. City boy, he thought. Oh, you city boy with your city boy ways. He made a mirror in his mind, a mirror of himself and saw how he most look. City boy with your city ways sitting in the sand, trying to read the tracks, not knowing, not understanding. Why would anything wild come up from the water to play in the sand? Not that way. Animals weren't that way. 
They didn't waste time. It had come up from the water for a reason, a good reason, and he must try to understand this reason. He must change to fully understand the reason himself. Well, he wouldn't make it. It had come up from the water for a reason, and the reason, he thought, squatting, the reason had to do with the pile of sand. He brushed the top off gently with his hand, but found only damp sand. Still, there must be a reason, and he carefully kept scraping and digging until, about four inches down, he suddenly came into a small chamber in the cool, damp sand, and there lay eggs, many eggs, almost perfect, round eggs the size of table tennis balls, and he laughed then because he knew it had been a turtle. He had seen a show on television about sea turtles that came up onto beaches and laid their eggs in the sand. There must be freshwater lake turtles that did the same. Maybe snapping turtles. He had heard of snapping turtles. They became fairly large, he thought. It must have been a snapper that came up in the night when he heard the noise that awakened him. She must have come then and laid eggs. Food. More than eggs, more than knowledge, more than anything. This was food. His stomachs tightened and rolled and made noise as he looked at the eggs. As if his stomach belonged to somebody else who had seen the eggs with its own eyes and was demanding food. The hunger always there had been somewhat controlled and dormant when there was nothing to eat. But with the eggs came the scream to eat. His whole body craved food with such an intensity that it quickened his breath. He reached into the nest and pulled the eggs out one at a time. There were seventeen of them, each as round as a ball and white. They had leathery shells that gave instead of breaking when he squeezed them. When he had them heaped on the sand in a pyramid, he had never felt so rich somehow. He suddenly realized he didn't know how to eat them. He had a fire but no way to cook them, no container, and he had never thought of eating a raw egg. He had an uncle named Carter, his father's brother, who always put an egg in a glass of milk and drain it in the morning. Brian had watched him do it once, just once, and when the runny part of the white left the glass and went into his uncle's mouth and down the throat in a single gulp, Brian almost lost everything he had ever eaten. Still, he thought, still, and his stomach moved towards his backbone. <laughs> Still, he thought, as his stomach moved towards his backbone, he became less and less fussy. Some natives in the world ate grasshoppers and ants, and if they could do that, he could get a raw egg down. He picked one up and tried to break the shell and found it surprisingly tough. Finally, using the hatchet, he sharpened a stick and poked a hole in the egg. He widened the hole with his finger and looked inside. Just an egg. It had a dark yellow yolk and not so much white as he thought there would be. Just an egg. Food. Just an egg he had to eat. Raw. He closed his eyes and looked out across the, he cl- he looked out across the lake and brought the egg to his mouth. Then he closed his eyes and sucked and squeezed the egg at the same time and swallowed as fast as he could. Ugh! It had a greasy, oily taste, but it was still an egg. His throat tried to throw it back up. His whole body seemed to convulse with it, but his stomach took it, held it, and demanded more. The second egg was easier. And by the third one, he had no trouble at all. It just slid down. He ate six of them. Could have easily eaten all of them and not been full. But part of him said, Hold back. 
save the rest. He could not now believe the hunger. The eggs awakened it full and roaringly so that it tore at him. After the sixth egg, he ripped the shell open and licked the inside clean, then went back and ripped the other five open and licked them out as well and wondered if he could eat the shells. There must be some food value in them. But when he tried, they were too leathery to chew, and he couldn't get them down. He stood away from the eggs for a moment, literally stood and turned away so he could not see them. If he looked at them, he would have to eat more. He would store them in the shelter and only eat one a day. He fought the hunger down, controlled it. He would take them now and store them and save them and eat one a day. And he realized as he thought he had forgotten they might come, the searchers. Surely they would come before he could eat all the eggs at one a day. He had forgotten to think about them, and that wasn't good. He had to keep thinking of them, because if he forgot them and did not think of them, they might forget about him, and he had to keep hoping. He had to keep hoping. All right, that brings us to chapter 11, but I think we'll save that for the next show. Just something with raw eggs, by the way, at least with chicken eggs. Uh, egg whites have a particular uh, protein in them. I think they're called avidin. It might be the name of the protein. But raw, your body cannot actually digest it well. It resists digestion. Because the purpose of an egg is to become some sort of, well, purpose of a chicken egg is to become a baby chicken, right? So it's not, it's not actually designed as food for us, even though it can become food. And so the whole thing with eating a raw egg, your body doesn't actually digest it that well. You actually digest a cooked egg or a boiled egg better than you would a raw egg. So despite... Despite Rocky Sylvester Stallone sucking down raw eggs, he'd be better off to eat some boiled eggs like Paul Newman in Cool Hand Luke, though maybe not that many. <laughs> For our younger audience members, the Paul Newman reference is probably just going to fly right past everybody. It's even before my time, realistically, but... <laughs> You can, after this, you can go on YouTube and type in Cool Hand Luke Eggs and go watch that scene. <laughs> All right, Mara says, greetings, everybody. I'm listening, but I'm busy. Grantish Crosby waves hello. And Janet Foster says, yay fire. All right, we should have a story time tomorrow. Tomorrow will probably be a Tolkien story time. I'll try to get up a note for that earlier. But tomorrow's is going to be a lot of fun because that's going to be the that's in the Fellowship of the Rings. That is the bridge of Casa Doom. So that's the that's the famous or iconic scene, the famous and iconic scene with Gandalf and the Balrog. For those of you who remember that, hey, there is David Pay, our good friend from Canada. He says he was an excellent boxer too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the cool hand look the cool hand look reference works both ways. But I'll try and get uh, a story time notice up early so everybody can see it for tomorrow, but that'll be Lord of the Rings, the Fellowship of the Ring, the Bridge of Kazadum. All right. Well, we're going to leave off here. I need to get up early and work in my garden and get some other things done. So, early to bed, early to rise. Well, I don't know if it makes me wealthy. It definitely makes me healthy. I'll take that. <laughs> Though if I get a, if I can get some, get some more, get some more vegetables planted tomorrow, that will certainly offset the grocery budget. All right. But thank you so much for spending a part of your evening with me. Good to have your company, and we hope to see you tomorrow night. Until we meet again, may God bless you and your families. Aloha. Good night.